You say you can explain this. It is interesting to find out. Sure. This, this question about the troposphere was so important in the film. Tell us what your perspective is. Sure. Well, let me address, maybe it was the last point that Ray said about the urban heat island effect. And it is clear that there is an urban heat island effect. Oh, yes, that is no is. joke. But the urban heat island effect cannot possibly explain the warming of the oceans over the 20th century. And the oceans have warmed up nearly as much as the land. And they are significant. And the data that you're looking at shows warming in the oceans. The problems with the satellite data are numerous, but in particular, there are two independent analyses of the satellite data that you're looking at. One shows significant warming, another one shows less warming. You're looking at the one that was prepared by uh, John Christie and Roy Spencer from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. That has a different process of joining the different satellite data sets together. There are uncertainties in that and they show significantly less warming. I think you're also looking at a record that doesn't take into account the cooling in the stratosphere which reduces the warming in the tropospheric temperature data set because the satellite channel spans both the stratosphere and the troposphere. So you have to be very careful in interpreting these satellite data sets. There are two independent records. They were included in the IPCC analysis. They were also included in a US government report which concluded, in which John Christie was an author, that there is no inconsistency between the surface temperatures and the tropospheric temperatures and the model projections of the response to increasing greenhouse gases. They are entirely consistent and John Christie was an author. He agreed with those conclusions. OK, I can see uh, Nick Rowley's uh, dying to get in here. <laughs> Nick Rowley, I should sit, just explain who you are because uh, I've been trying to introduce our guests as we've been going along. Nick Rowley was uh, Chief Scientific Advisor or Chief uh, uh, Climate Change Advisor to uh, Tony Blair. Um, for some time he was one of the people who helped set up the Stern Report. So uh, please go ahead. Well, Tony, I suppose the thing that I just want to make clear is what are we really debating here? And what we're debating is a result of Martin Durkin's film is the basic science of observed global warming. Now, terms like observed global warming are used interchangeably with regard to global warming generally and also with regard to climate change. Now, the science of observed global warming, notwithstanding the fact we're having quite a robust debate here, if you look at the great bulk of the world's climate scientists, around 98% of them really accept that basic science. That is as close to certain almost as you can get in relation to science. Yet there are uncertainties, and those uncertainties are essentially about the future, and future prediction is always going to be uncertain, and that's why when you look at the IPCC reports, you have scenarios. You have lower scenarios, middle scenarios, and upper scenarios. And for mine, I very much hope that, you know, they're wrong. I very much hope we don't have a problem, but I think when you look at the balance of evidence, we do. So when you look at those scenarios and you look at where we are travelling in relation to that warming, when it actually gets very scary is not actually with the warming effect. It's what the severe climate effects are going to be of that warming. And that's when, when we had briefings from major scientists and others at 10 Downing Street, that's when it gets very frightening because that's when scientists actually become ashen-faced and say, well, I can't really say what is going to happen with that amount of carbon in the atmosphere that amount of warming and therefore what's going to happen in terms of severe weather. And that's when this issue is not actually about science, it's about security. It's about economic security, it's about our physical security in relation to the human population movements that may well occur if the future predictions prove even half right. Nick Rowley, while you're talking, I, I, I want to ask you how seriously uh, this film was taken in the UK and did it actually change the debate there and did it influence policy? Well I'm still in touch with a fair few people who do work in climate change globally and certainly in the UK as well. I mean the term was used, you are telling lies, very early on in the program and Robin did a very good job of saying well who are those liars when you're talking about the scientific community. Well those lies, I think when Martin put those, those words in the uh, documentary, I think he was only referring to scientific lies. I think he was also talking about people in the media, he was talking about senior politicians, he was possibly talking about some people who he might have had front of mind. They include not, uh, you know, how can one say, liberal-minded uh, environmentalists who think we should all go and live in yurts and eat organic food. <laughs> He's talking about people like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's talking about business leaders like 
Rupert Murdoch. He's talking about uh, people like Chancellor Merkel uh, in, in Germany, Tony Blair, yes, and he's been mentioned by Bob Carter, uh, David Attenborough. Now, David Attenborough is someone who has taken a while to really get involved in this debate, but he's put together an absolutely fantastic documentary, which is looking at the level of risk that the world is placed under by this problem, and problem it is, and big problem it is. So he is really, in that programme, Martin Durkin is not just talking about scientists, he's talking about a lot of people who he is calling liars. Let me bring in another of our uh, panellists now, uh, Dr uh, Nikki Williams, is the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, New South Wales Minerals Council, Director of the Australian Coal Association. Now, those titles alone might once have suggested that you'd be a sceptic. Certainly not. I mean, the, uh, the industry for at least a decade uh, in Australia has acknowledged the uh, reality of global warming, the contribution of man-made CO2 and, uh, and other greenhouse gases, and importantly, um, recognises that the potential uh, risks associated with climate change uh, are such that action is required. We have to take action, and we, we as a, a producing industry have a very important role there. And I think there are some very important points that you raised. Essentially, it's not the science. It's actually the policy responses to the magnitude of the risk. And I guess that's where the key debate needs to move now. We need to make sure that our responses, because they will have major social, economic and political impacts, are proportionate to the magnitude of the risk. So actually defining that risk and increasing the robustness of the science, refining our understanding of the models and all of those sorts of things are important if we're going to deliver uh, results which are not only appropriate in the developed world, but most importantly for the developing world. Ray Evans, um, as I said, you worked in this area in the past, advising Hugh Morgan. I mean, does it feel strange to you to hear uh, a new generation of people working in the fossil fuel industry who think completely differently to you? <coughs> no, my experience in, <coughs> in industry over 20 years uh, was that <coughs> many companies can't wait to roll down or lie down and get rolled over because they're frightened to contest the issues. And certainly the response of many coal companies has been both predictable and pathetic. Uh, but uh, the, thing that, uh, the thing that impresses me in terms of the way in which the Greens have taken out, firstly, Shell, and BP uh, and other oil companies, and, of course, Enron. Don't forget Enron was one of the great supporters of uh, global warming, uh, was that they forgot to worry about the beer industry because it was the beer industry which funded... Henrik Svensmark's experiments <coughs> on cosmic rays, because all other sources of uh, support had been denied him. And the thing that I find extraordinary about this debate is the sheer bloody-mindedness, the desperation that is now manifest on the part of the, uh, the anthropogenists, as I call them, who are convinced, despite all the evidence, that anthropogenic carbon dioxide is the main driver of climate, uh, as opposed to those people who find that the evidence is not there, has not been there, and who object mightily to the fact that the IPCC will commit fraud in order to try and persuade people that its claims about CO2 and temperature are right. Could and I the, say actually... No, no, hang on, let me finish. Man's <laughs> hockey stick yeah. was a fraud. It, it was okay. a fraud, and if that had been... <laughs> If it had been put forward by a private company seeking support to float the stock exchange, those people would now be in jail.